This is a piece of music called Return to Kintail, or I will go home to the cattlefold of Kintail to translate its original Gallic title. Said by some to have been written at the Battle of Sheriff Muir during the Jacobite Uprising in 1715, others have suggested that the tune may have been known to our Mackenzie ancestors as early as 1600. In that respect, this song of longing for a homeland left behind is arguably the earliest piece of music directly associated with the Mackenzies, and it would have been familiar to clansmen throughout the period I'm covering in this talk. Much of the accompanying background music that follows is also highly appropriate, being taken from a late 17th century manuscript of lute music known as the Balcaris Lute Book, which I will return to in due course. Since the Cayley is such a valued tradition for the Clan Mackenzie Society and something we've all missed in the last year, by way of compensation I thought it would be interesting to paint a picture of how our forebears entertained themselves in their leisure in the 17th and 18th centuries. Contrary to a perception that might be common, life at that time in the far north of Scotland wasn't exclusively solitary, poor, nasty, brutish and short, to quote Thomas Hobbes's depiction of what he saw as primitive societies. Our ancestors undoubtedly appear to have known how to enjoy themselves. Some long-standing followers of the Clan Mackenzie magazine may have noticed that in a number of my writings I have been at pains to stress the cultural and intellectual achievements of the Mackenzies and besides the usual political and financial interests that we are so used to hearing about from historians, because these are our ancestors, our family, I feel that it's important for us to get a fuller insight into what added that further dimension to their lives that went beyond merely getting by what would have made their lives fulfilling and rewarding for them. While I should stress that the more elite members of the family were obviously exceptions, someone like the last Earl of Seaforth was in the enviable position of being able to devote pretty much his entire life to the pursuit of pleasure, participating in the highest levels of European culture. An accomplished connoisseur unusually liberal for someone of his social status in his marriage to Harriet Powell, which challenged the conventions of his day. The actress is shown here in Catherine Reed's portrait, holding a vial. He was a man who is admirable for his artistic and scientific patronage and appreciation of Roman antiquity in particular. He was evidently highly regarded by such contemporary luminaries as Sir Joseph Banks, Sir William Hamilton and Captain James Cook, who were his devoted friends. This is him standing in the centre of Pietro Fabrice's charming painting, with William Hamilton playing the violin on his left, and the Mozarts, father and son, on the harpsichord, which Seaforth himself played surrounded by his collection of contemporary art and Roman antiquities in his palazzo in the centre of Naples. He was also a patron of the Neapolitan composer Niccolò Iomelli, who appears seated on the right of Fabrice's companion painting. The present and following pieces of music are from Iomelli's opera Armida Abandonata, which Seaforth would have witnessed at the Teatro San Carlo in Naples from the time of their association in the early 1770s, and in parts of which I can't help detecting an influence 
on the later works of Mozart. Seaforth was a sociable creature from a precocious age and the Scottish artist Catherine Reid painted this little milord, as he was called, in Rome in 1752, when he was on the grand tour with his tutor, Dr James Mackenzie, who was my ancestor's cousin. An equally remarkable individual, as part of the circle of the Edinburgh Enlightenment, Dr James, known as Benevolent Mackenzie, wrote in his retirement on history and health but especially pertinent to us today is his visionary early promotion of vaccination against disease. This is Sir Joshua Reynolds's portrait, which shows Seaforth, third from the left, as a member of the Society of Dilettanti, which included his good friends Joseph Banks on the far right here and William Hamilton. And this is another painting by Pietro Fabrice, which I had the good fortune of handling in my capacity as an old master painting specialist at Bonhams, and which shows both a concert party and boating party hosted by the gregarious Earl at the Villa Pavoncelli, which is just outside Naples, and can be seen here on the left with its Mackenzie blue and gold awnings. Seaforth and Hamilton were both fascinated by volcanoes and a steaming Vesuvius is shown in the background. Even for as illustrious and intellectually adventurous a family member as George Mackenzie, the first Earl of Cromarty, who was like the last Earl of Seaforth, a member of the Royal Society and enormously erudite, his true pleasures appear to have been the relatively simple ones of sociability and friendship, which I've always felt are easy to relate to. This can be gleaned from a letter written around 1703 from James, second Duke of Queensbury, which he declared to have written to the Earl while playing at cards with Lord Renfrew. I just now received your letter, for which I give you, my dear Lord, a thousand thanks. I go from hence tomorrow, about ten in the forenoon, and I should be very glad to see you before I went, if that could be done without giving you trouble or jealousy to others. My coach is at your command, and the bearer will attend you if you'll come here tonight. You shall have a little broth, a glass of good wine, and half an hour's laughing. Shortly before his death, Cromarty remarked to the Earl of North Esk on the value he put on such friendships. It is now very near to eight years since that fellow, ordinarily called Good Luck, did with a severe grip shake hands with me, and I think never to meet until the rendezvous at the Valley of Jehoshaphat, where I hope to meet with good friends and good company. Contrary to the stereotype of the Highlander subsisting on illicit whisky and beer, we can be sure that even in Rossshire, a glass of good wine would most often have meant a fine claret. I came to learn this somewhat surprising fact when looking into the background of my own family history. <laughs> Donald Macaulay, the father-in-law of Murdo Mackenzie, Bishop of Murray and subsequently of Orkney, was described in the 18th century manuscript history of Dr George Mackenzie as a vintner. Bishop Murdo's son-in-law, James Dunbar of Dalcross, was also a merchant in Inverness who was involved in the wine trade, and further descendants of my particular family line were described as vintners in the 18th century. A contemporary valuation role shows that in the first decades of the 17th century, this Donald, 
who was a merchant burgess of Fortrose, owned the fishings at Rosemarkey, which was the port of Fortrose, the Mackenzie's effective capital on the Black Isle. In fact, these fishings were inherited by his grandson, Captain James Mackenzie, who combined a military career with also being a merchant burgess in Inverness. The promontories of Shannonry Point to the north and that on which Fort George now stands to the south create a bottleneck at this point on the Murray Firth which concentrates the salmon returning to the River Ness and Bewley. This is why it's a popular place for spotting bottlenose dolphins today and would have made it a very lucrative place to own the fishing rights. But it's no coincidence that Donald Macaulay's family was from Lewis and historians have shown that the trade in fish, largely herring, in the Outer Hebrides at this time was primarily conducted from the east coast ports of Scotland. We know that fish were exported from these waters to Bordeaux and to the Ile de Ré, which by then supported well-established Scottish colonies, from which wine and salt, which they primarily used to cure the fish, were brought back. Indeed, the broadcaster and author of Knee Deep in Claret, Billy Kay, even argues that Claret has legitimate claim to being Scotland's original national drink, ahead of whisky, describing it as the bloodstream of the old alliance, as well as being a military alliance based on a long-standing friendship, a Franco-Scottish deal signed in 1295, gave Scottish merchants privileged access to Bordeaux's finest wines for centuries, much to the annoyance of English wine drinkers who received an inferior product. Of course, wine was a highly politicised commodity. While their Hanoverian opponents favoured port, claret was the drink with which a Jacobite Mackenzie would toast the king over the water. Fish was also the most significant import in the Tuscan port of Livorno. In 1675, another one of Donald Macaulay's grandsons who was an Inverness merchant Burgess, my direct ancestor, Donald Mackenzie, was petitioning to raise funds to pay for the ransom of his son, William, who had been captured by Algerian pirates off the coast of Leghorn, as the Tuscan port of Livorno was known to the Scots and English at that time. No doubt William would have been following in the family tradition by trading fish from the Atlantic and North Sea, as well as other commodities such as cloth from his father's business, in exchange for Tuscan wines and quite possibly also some of the more exotic goods such as Asian spices that this freeport was known for, being at the time a rival with Venice as a bridge between northwestern Europe and the Ottoman Empire. We can perhaps speculate that the Highland Table at its best then had more to offer than simply neeps and tatties. Of course the Mackenzie's chief would have drunk the finest claret that Donald Macaulay and his descendants were able to supply while enjoying the most sophisticated entertainments at Braun Castle. In May We Be Britons, I wrote of how in the age of sea travel, the highlands and islands were anything but isolated. While Gallic culture preserved its own traditions, these traditions were by no means cut off. Bardic poetry, for example, made frequent allusion to classical Latin literature, and some of it was love poetry, with historical affinities with the continental tradition of chanson. 
between the 13th and 17th centuries, Gallic harpers were much praised in the highest cultural circles of Europe. Their music was enjoyed in England at the courts of James I and Charles I, at the Danish court of Christian IV, and by German, Polish and Spanish royalty. The first Earl of Seaforth's brother-in-law and close friend, Sir Donald Mackay, First Lord Ray, was a regular guest at court in Denmark, Germany and Sweden, bringing his musicians from Northwest Sutherland, as well as a number of Mackenzie relatives in his regiment with him, including the young Bishop Murdo as chaplain, who was also Ray's cousin. In fact, Bishop Murdo's brother's family settled in Ray's country in Sutherland. This is a contemporary German print which is believed to depict Ray's Highland soldiers and the Mackay household sustained its patronage of the arts until his son, John Mackay, second Lord Ray, who typified the hybridised combination of a late Renaissance education on the continent with a native Gallic culture. The Mackays continued their connection with the Mackenzies as hereditary pipers to the Mackenzies of Gerloch. Indeed, it might be noted that as late as the early 18th century, William D. Mackenzie, 5th Earl and 2nd Jacobite Marquess of Seaforth, and his sister Lady Mary, a close friend of the poet Alexander Pope, both received their education at the Jacobite court of Saint-Germain. The chateau can be seen in the background of this portrait of William and was famous at the time for attracting some of the best contemporary French and Italian musicians. William must have been a fascinating character for his widely eclectic tastes, since at the same time he continued to employ Murdo Matheson as his bard and maintained traditional troops of pipers to entertain him on his progress through his territories in Kintail, Loch Elsh and Lewis. While the Seaforth accounts show him to have remunerated itinerant musicians on an ad hoc basis, such as the one-off payment of one pound, one shilling and sixpence to Daniel Melville, the classical harper, in June 1710. Melville is known to have travelled the country as he is also found in Edinburgh in 1709 when he had recently arrived from Ireland with his wife Helen. Such men also entertain the chief and his guests as chroniclers and bearers of news and gossip. William's hybrid nature thus also firmly defies the stereotypical image of the coarse Highland savage that was promoted by both the Lowland Scots and the English well into the 18th century. In fact, this prejudice appears to have been so entrenched that it persists even to this day. In 2014, I was invited to take part in the episode entitled Battle in the Glens concerning the Battle of Glensheel in 1719 for the Channel 4 television series Walking Through History. After the day's filming, the crew had dinner in the Kintail Lodge Hotel and during the course of the conversation, Tony Robinson commented on how he loved the idea of William as a mixture of Highland warlord and cultivated European. The two English academic historians present who were actually quite distinguished and really should have known better, were totally sceptical, being of the opinion that all Highlanders of the period were without exception uneducated barbarians. In this regard, one should note what has been said of Roderick Morrison, the blind harper of Dunvegan, who died in 1714, and whose close Mackenzie relatives included his mother, foster brother and sister-in-law. Although he's been dubbed Gallic Scotland's last minstrel, 
recent musicologists have recognised that his role was more as a gentleman musician who should have been regarded also as representative of the cosmopolitan drawing room music of the period, cultivated by the upper ranks of society throughout Europe. Like many exiled Highland Jacobites, William Dew and his sister Lady Mary Mackenzie's musical education at Saint-Germain would have been remarkably advanced. For there King James and his Modernese wife had established an important centre of Italian music. They had a decisive influence on the development of musical taste by helping to introduce and popularise Italian styles in France. In fact, John Carroll I, the uncle of Lady Mary's future husband, was himself a viol player, and having previously been the King's ambassador in Rome, he was responsible for recruiting Innocenzo Fede as master of James's music and went on to be instrumental in organising concerts at his court in exile. Whilst the Chateau de Saint-Germain possessed the finest court theatre in France, used by Louis XIV to put on Lully's comedies, ballets and tragedies, among the large repertory of secular music, which we know to have been performed, other than that of Fede himself, the most frequently represented was that of Alessandro Scarlatti, whose cantatas and sonatas had a crucial influence on the development of French music. This is a particularly breathtaking piece of Scarlatti's music from his Giudetta. But I should also stress that fine entertainment was not the preserve of the aristocracy in the Highlands, since it would have been shared with his clansmen by a good laird who prided himself on hospitality, as indeed would the likes of Bishop Murdo, who was, and I quote, a most worthy bishop and greatly loved for his hospitality. Notable occasions for the special display of such sociableness would have taken place in the Great Hall of the Earl's Palace, which was the Bishop's residence in Kirkhall, seen here in its ruined form today. But this is a reconstruction of the Great Hall in the heyday of the Earls of Orkney, who were Murdo's immediate predecessors in occupying the palace. One such occasion would have been on the 4th of April, 1678, when George Balfour of Farre married Murdo's second daughter, Marjorie, and again on the 15th of May in the same year, when John Kennedy of Kermunks married Jean, his eldest daughter. And one suspects that the bishop himself would have enjoyed those occasions, especially since there was a long-standing tradition that when he first landed on Orkney at Scarpa and, as tradition dictated, the ancient chalice known as the Bishop's Cup was handed to him filled with strong ale, he drained it in one go and asked for more. This was deemed a good omen and he certainly went on to be an especially popular bishop. K. 
continuing my picture of the Mackenzies at play, from having looked into my own family's history, I know that my 17th century ancestor, Donald Mackenzie's daughter, Anne, married the tutor of MacLeod, John MacLeod of Contulich and Muravenside. The tutor's daughter, Christian, married John MacLeod of Talisker in Skye, whose hospitable household was the subject of eulogy in several poems of the time which are quoted in the volume which William Matheson edited for the Scottish Gaelic Text Society, entitled Anne Classe Dahl, or The Blind Harper, the songs of Roderick Morrison and his music. This is how Talisker House looks today. Matheson's study sheds valuable light on a society in which a coterie of poets and musicians were in the habit of foregathering under Talisker's convivial roof. One such member of this Talisker circle was John Mackay, known as Ampurberdal, or the Blind Piper, from the family who were pipers to the Mackenzie Lairds of Gerloch, continuing the musical tradition of their chief, Lord Ray, that I've already mentioned. Celebrated as both musician and bard, Mackay came to the MacLeod country in his youth to study bagpipe music under the elite tuition of Patrick McCrimmon and wrote the following lines that refer to our family's cousin, Christian Lady Talisker, who is evidently also an accomplished harper. I am a guest just now, like the sound of a wave on the shore, where beguiling to me were the harp strings of the lady without blemish, daughter of the tutor of MacLeod. Another poet, John MacLean, journeyed to Talisker from his native Mull, and in a song called Orondo MacLugash, he recalls the hospitality he received from the chief of the MacLeods, Ian Breck, in company with Roderick Morrison, in the following verse. I was one day in Dunvegan with bountiful John of Harris, among the devotees of the harp, where poets kept pace with its music, Roderick and I would compose rhymes of a few verses and would receive potent drinks that I preferred to a sizable bannock. I don't know whether the whisky of Talisker at that time would have been similar to the peaty and smoky single malt of today, but those potent drinks would no doubt have been what William Dew, Marquis of Seaforth, described to his continental comrades on the eve of the Battle of Glenshiel as Isle of Sky, Champagne. Another house that Roderick the Blind Harper is thought to have frequented was that of another close cousin of my ancestors, Mackenzie of Cool whose house was situated in the parish of Contin, which is just to the west of Strathpeffer, and of which his brother, the Reverend Angus Morrison, was incumbent. This is the present-day Cool House, rebuilt at the end of the 18th century and now a hotel. Angus was married to Mackenzie of Cool's cousin, Anne, and a song connected with a girl of this household runs as follows. The family of Cool and Applecross is close in your reckoning of kinsfolk, the most hospitable family in Scotland, who won that fame and place. The high nobility and renown that you inherited cannot be related in this song. Whatever it lacks in proclaiming your fame, 
it is the harper who could sum it up. This conveys the almost mystical and sacred place both the harp and the bard held in Gallic society. And very much in this spirit, among the poems that would have been recited in such houses were the ancient heroic sagas of the Ossianic tradition. Most unfortunately, James Macpherson's attempt to pass his Tales of Ossian off as an exact translation led Dr Johnson famously to dismiss these stories as outright forgeries and I couldn't help noticing that even in as academically rigorous an exhibition as the 2015 Celts show that was put on by the British Museum in partnership with the National Museum of Scotland, this oversimplistic accusation of fakery was uncritically repeated. However, there is clear evidence that these popular stories surrounding Fingal and his band of ancient heroes were current in oral tradition in the Highlands and Islands before Macpherson published his massively popular volumes. These tales were by no means an outright forgery, but based on a genuine ancient oral tradition. As well as being the view of the best informed scholars today, this was in fact the conclusion that was reached by the celebrated novelist Henry Mackenzie when he edited the Ossian Report of 1805 to examine the authenticity of the poems. And I've myself come across the testament of Mackenzie's from the time who remember hearing some of the stories recited by bards at social gatherings long before Macpherson made them famous and his interpretations had gone on to be met with admiration by the likes of Schiller and Goethe. His works were even said to have been among Napoleon's favourite reading. And Fingal's Cave, which was visited by the naturalist and friend of the last Earl of Seaforth, Sir Joseph Banks, was to go on to inspire such a mainstream European composer as Felix Mendelssohn to write his Hebridean Overture. Although unfortunately less documented, we know that the local inn or Cayley House would also have been on the itinerary of a number of these celebrated bards and musicians. And here the more ordinary clansmen would have warmed themselves beside peat fires and met their friends, neighbours and cousins to exchange news and gossip and would have been transported from the drudgery of their daily hardships, taking pleasure in the entertainment of such skilled artists as Ampiobert Dahl and Anclaser Dahl, as they shared their treasured stories and songs. In the words of Donald A. Mackenzie, writing at, even at the beginning of the last century in his Wonder Tales from Scottish Myth and Legend, on long dark winter nights it is still the custom in small villages for friends to collect in a house and hold what they call a cayley. Young and old are entertained by the reciters of old poems and legendary stories which deal with ancient beliefs, the doings of traditional heroes and heroines and so on. Some sing old and new songs set to old music or new music composed in the manner of the old. So we see that after the Reformation, the secular popular tradition of music continued to flourish by popular demand, despite attempts by the Kirk, particularly in the Lowlands, to suppress dancing and the playing of music at events like weddings. What is more, the Highlands in the early 17th century saw the development of piping families, including the McCrimmons, MacArthur's, MacGregor's and the Mackays of Gerloch, who I've mentioned. There is also evidence of the adoption of the fiddle 
in this region with Martin Martin, noting in 1703 in his description of the Western Isles of Scotland that he knew of 18 players in Lewis alone. Interestingly, there was a Donald Mackenzie who had the rare profession of being a violer in Edinburgh, whose children were buried in Sir George Mackenzie of Rosoff's tomb in Greyfriars Kirkyard, which the Society paid a visit to a few years ago. Outside my own immediate family, Donald was not at that time a common Christian name for Mackenzie's. My brother Kevin and I have discovered that another grandson of our ancestor Donald Macaulay, who was the main progenitor of this Donald naming tradition, a collector of excise in Edinburgh called George Mackenzie, had close connections with the Maul family, from whom he acquired his estate of Pitcarrow in Angus, and who were cousins of his wife, Elizabeth Lyon. The Earl of Panmure's sons, James and Harry Mool, were both vile players, who in the 1680s paid a visit to another vile player, their cousin, David Nairn, in Paris. Nairn, who was to go on to serve for 40 years as a loyal clerk to James Francis Edward Stuart at his exiled courts, was then living in the Rue Saint-Antoine in the Marais district, where the local organists were the eminent court composers Michel Richard de Lalande and François Couperin, who are believed to have introduced the Maul brothers to the celebrated but reclusive viol player Jean de saint Colombe. The Panier manuscripts provide us with a unique record of the music of both Saint Colombe and his pupil Marin Marais, none of which was actually published at the time and only became known to the wider world in 1973. The impact of their subsequent frame resulting in the acclaimed 1991 film in fact, one of my favourite films of all time, Tous les matins du monde, in which Gérard Depardieu played Marin Marais. The specific naming patterns of the family of Donald the Edinburgh Viola, when coupled with this particularly unusual profession, might lead one to speculate that George Mackenzie of Pitcarrow's close association with the Maul family could well explain the identity of these intriguing Mackenzie Greyfriars burials. In 2004, a manuscript dating from 1716 that was discovered in the archives of Berkeley Castle was authenticated to be six fully scored and hitherto unpublished arias from Vivaldi's opera La Costanza Trionfante. The plot of this opera is concerned with dethroning usurpers and restoring lawful kings and the Jacobite historian Edward Corp has convincingly argued that it was most likely copied for the second Marquis of Seaforth's cousin and self-styled Mackenzie Bairn, the Duke of Mar, in order to be performed at the Jacobite court, which at that time was based in Urbino. Being aware that as descendants of the last Earl of Seaforth's daughter, Lady Caroline Mackenzie, the Barclay family inherited much of Seaforth's art collection. It occurred to me that this would be a likely explanation for this manuscript's presence at Barclay Castle. 
and having renewed my old correspondence with Edward Corp, we have between us established that these important musical manuscripts were most likely brought back from Urbino by James Maul, who had then succeeded as 4th Earl of Panmure and was the Duke of Mar's nephew, and that the scores were then given to Lord Seaforth when these two men were both living in Paris in the 1720s, and when Seaforth was intriguingly given the Rue Saint-Antoine as his address there. The post-Reformation period saw the creation of the Kaol Moor, or Great Music, the Pibroch style, a slow, more classical form of traditional bagpipe music, which reflected its martial origins, with battle tunes, marches, salutes and laments, which were usually heard at official gatherings and formal occasions. The Kaol Beg, or Little Music, included jigs, reels, strathspeys, as well as slow airs played at a Cayley. This is Seaforth's Lament, which was composed in honour of William Dew and is an example of the Kaol Moor. I Will Return to Kintail is popular today in bagpipe, harp, guitar and violin recordings, but hundreds of years ago it was above all the harp or clarsach that was the important mm. instrument played in the Scottish Highlands. Eventually its place in society was taken by the bagpipes, but many tunes we now think of as pipe or fiddle tunes are thought to have begun as harp tunes. The function of the Klarsach in a Hebridean lordship is illustrated in the songs of the 17th century poet Mary Nicklaud, in which the chief is praised as one who is skilled in judging harp playing, as well as the theme and sense of a good story. The music of harp and pipe is shown in these poems to have been intrinsic to the splendour of the MacLeod Court at Dunvegan, as depicted here, along with wine in shining cups. The significance of the harp to the Mackenzies can also be seen, for example, in the symbolism found on the ornate fireplace lintel at Kilcoy Castle which bears the date 1679 and is carved with three Mackenzie coats of arms along with the two mermaids playing harps, one at each end of the lintel. Kilcoy is part of a triangle comprising of Kilcoy on the east, Balverde on the west and Kinkel Castle at the apex in the north, all approximately two and a half miles from each other in the Mackenzie's territory on the Black Isle, and all with harping connections. Balverde translates as the township of the Bard, and the Mackenzie's of Gerloch's property at Kinkel was historically known as Kinkel Klarsach. As well as their celebrated patronage of the Mackay Pipers, my early Mackenzie of Gerloch ancestors would evidently have enjoyed a significant tradition of harp music. A considerable number of Scottish folk melodies, songs and dances were also written for the lute. James IV, James V and Mary Queen of Scots all played the lute, and to those of the noble classes who still adhered to the court's artistic ideals after James VI moved the court to London in 1603, lute music was a natural expression of their musical talents. 
The old alliance of Scotland and France was still strong during the 17th century and many young Scotsmen were sent to France as part of their education. This was the great age of French lute music and this explains the large amount of French lute music by the most celebrated masters which are preserved in such manuscripts as the Rowallan lute book, the Stralach lute book, the Panmure lute book, the Lady Margaret Weems lute book and the Balcaras lute book. It's probably no coincidence that I first encountered these exquisite pieces of music in this recording by Jacob Lindeberg because it had a photograph of Aileen Donnan Castle on the cover. Copied out in Scotland at the close of the 17th century, the Balcaris Lute Book is the largest and most important post-1640 British source of lute music. It contains 252 compositions arranged for the 11 course instrument, among them settings of native Scots airs and of English popular tunes, along with lute music from the leading mid and later 17th century French masters, all of which would have been popular throughout Scotland. It is believed to have been compiled by or for Margaret Campbell the fourth wife of Colin Lindsay, 3rd Earl of Balcarres, who was the son of the charismatic Lady Anna Mackenzie, daughter of the 1st Earl of Seaforth. The burial of the viola Donald Mackenzie's children in the particularly grand tomb of Sir George Mackenzie suggests a close relationship to this nephew of the Earl of Seaforth and thus a relatively high status for such musicians. In fact, a number of the clan elite were themselves amateur musicians, as we have seen with Christian Lady Talisker. And both the families of Mackenzie of Gruenard and of Applecross boasted celebrated performers of the viol. This is the Mackenzie Laird's of Gruenard's seat, Udrigal House, and this is Applecross House. Some of the more cultivated Laird's houses had a Klasach player in residence as well as a piper, although the latest research shows that many such musicians were itinerant and not necessarily tied to the highlands and islands even. Another one of my direct ancestors, Rory Mackenzie of Applecross, who lived in the first half of the 17th century, and his son John, the second laird of Applecross, enjoyed a reputation for generously rewarding visiting harpers, such as the Earl of Antrim's musical protégé, by purportedly filling one of the harper's hands with gold and the other with silver. The Scottish lute manuscripts are an invaluable record of the sort of eclectic music that may well have been the attempt of amateurs to write down tunes which they heard played on the harp, thus giving us a precious insight into the otherwise lost musical tradition that must have played an essential part in the lives of our Mackenzie ancestors, who would have enjoyed a rich musical diversity. This piece from the Balcaras lute book is a duet between a harper and a viola. I hope you have enjoyed my talk on the social life of the Mackenzies in the 17th and 18th centuries, 
which I believe illustrates the highly sophisticated, diverse and cosmopolitan nature of Highland culture during this early modern period. While I don't pretend to be an expert on Highland music and poetry, nor indeed on Gaelic pronunciation, I just wanted to share some of what I had come across when looking into in particular the history of my own family, for whom I have a great deal of respect and admiration, especially after having discovered that I share many of their interests and passions. <laughs> 